So we're going to start back with the reaction mechanism for alkane, which is what is the mechanism for the for the reaction of alkane? The, the, the free radical only, substitution. Right, that's the only mechanism for alkenes. And how many stages are, are there in this mechanism? Three. three. What are the three stages? Initiation, propagation, termination. That is correct. And we're going to use the molecule of methane. So CH4, CH4. Um, just mute the mic comment because when it's not muted, the board is not going to show on the video. All right. So just mute the mic. So this is okay. the. Yes. Sorry, what reaction mechanism is this for again? And so we are looking at the reaction of alkanes. So it's the halogenation of alkane. So the reaction is halogenation, but the mechanism is free radical substitution. Sorry, and that's the only mechanism that goes for alkanes. Right. For strictly alkanes. If you have an halo alkane, it would be SN1 and SN2, which I'm going to do after this one. So as we said, the first step in this mechanism, remember your mic has to be muted because in the video, the board is not going to be shown, is there a screen? All right, so as we said, the first step is initiation. And in initiation, we are going to generate our free, free radicals. So free radicals will be formed. Remember also in this mechanism, all the bonds are broken homolytically. That means when this bond breaks between the two chlorine atoms, each atom is going to get one electron. And so homolytic, put on the board, each bond or this bond it is going to break homolytically. And for when a bond is being broken, how would I get the recording for you yesterday? It's on YouTube. All right. When it breaks homolytically, each, elect, each atom is going to get an electron. For reaction mechanism, we are going to use either a fish hook or a curved arrow. When you're using a fish hook, it's when you are transferring a single electron and the curved arrow is when you are transferring a pair of electrons. So this bond is being broken homolytically. So we are using fish hook. You only use curved arrows for heterolytic bond breaking. So fish hook for homolytic Curves are for heterolytic. In every bond, there are two electrons. This atom is going to get one electron. This atom is going to get a next electron. And so we get our radicals. This reaction, it needs UV light. 
So the only condition for this reaction, the only condition. You should have been. Just a second. Somebody's mic is on. Right, so if they ask the condition for this reaction, it is UV light. And it is, it is used in this step to break the halogen bond. Right. So that is what occurs in the initiation step. After initiation, it is propagation. Let me just use the end table for propagation. So is anyone writing this? Otherwise, I'm going to erase the board. No, sir. All right. So propagation is where you will introduce your alkene. So we're using methane. Radicals are reactive species. So in this, in this stage of the mechanism, you will always need a radical to be present, a radical and a molecule. So if we're introducing the methane molecule here, that means we need a radical because it is the radicals that are causing the reaction to occur. They are very reactive species. So the methane molecule is not going to react with the chlorine radical. What is going to happen? The bond between the carbon and the hydrogen is going to be broken homolytically. So the hydrogen gets one, one electron and the carbon gets one electron. So remember, each single one, two electrons are present. Hydrogen takes one. The hydrogen is using its one electron to form a bond with the chlorine radical. And to show, the, to represent the bond forming process, we are pointing both of the fish hooks towards each other. So this means that the hydrogen and chlorine are forming a bond, while the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen is being broken because the carbon is getting back its electron and the same goes for hydrogen. So as a product, the, the hydrogen is now removed from the carbon and the carbon has an unpaired election, right? Plus, the hydrogen is now bonded with the chlorine. So now you have your methyl radical and the molecule of HCl. Propagation is consists of two steps. So it is in this step, we are going to form the halo alkene. And at this point, we don't have our halo alkene as yet. All we have is the methyl radical. And remember I said in this stage, a radical is always reacting with a molecule. So the methyl radical in the second step of propagation, the methyl radical is going to react with a molecule of chlorine. Also, bear in mind that when this reaction is taking place, you would have 
four dots of alkane in a beaker, right? So, for example, we would have four so the cyclohexane in a beaker. So, it's not like this reaction involves one molecule of the alkane and one molecule of the halogen. You will have a lot of okay, molecules. You will have a lot of halogens as well as the radicals. All right. So just bear that in mind. Is not one. Is not one methane molecule and one chlorine molecule. So when I get this methyl radical, it can react with the next chlorine molecule that is present. So that is what will happen. Please make your mic. All right. So the methyl radical is going to react with this. So again, this bond has to be broken. It's going to be broken homolytically. So this chlorine gets one electron and it is using its one electron to combine with carbons, one electron. So these two are forming a bond, this chlorine and this carbon atom. And this chlorine here, it would remove its electron. So we would end up with chloromethane and the chlorine radical. Right? And so that is how we get our halogen. So propagation, it consists of two steps. However, there is such a compound as tetra chloromethane. All right? This is just chloromethane. You can actually end up with tetra chloromethane. What would happen? You will do step one and step two again. So at this stage, depending on what the question asks, if it asks you to show how chloromethane can be obtained from methane, this is it. This is how we obtain chloromethane. Or if it asks you to show mono substitution. So this is mono substitution. Right? Mono is one. If you are showing that is substitution, that's two. Three or four substitution. Is someone might give me a second? Okay, so let me just repeat. If your mic is on in the video, when I upload it, your screen will be shown and not the board. So just ensure that your mic is off. All right. So the question asks us to do di substitution, right? Which is two, it would need four steps. So I am going to do two more steps. So after I get chloro, methane, I am going to go back up here and draw chloro, methane. And as I said before, the same exact reaction is going to take place. That means chloromethane, and they are just going to arrange it so that the hydrogen is here, and you put the halogen somewhere else. So the, the same exact reaction is going to take place. You have a chloride radical, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen breaks. Right, that is it. 
So down here, you would have your chloramine dilute radical drafted with a chlorine molecule, and you will end up with two chlorine atoms. Any question at this point? You understand what just happened? Yes, sir. Right. And so, what if we wanted to put a next chlorine on this? What would we do? All right, somebody said no. So, we did step one and step two, and we get chlorobethane. All right. Sir, I have a question. Also, a suggestion. Someone in chat said that you could just clean your clean yourself so that um. I said that I can I cannot clean this. Is the first is the guest that can clean their screen. Well, maybe try spotlighting yourself. There's a setting that you can spotlight yourself. What's so, that? Yeah, we only see your screen. How would I do that? I think you have to click on your name and uh, click on the little box. The more. Right, so click on my name. Yeah, and you'll see, I think you have more. Spotlight video. Yes, yeah, spotlight your video so we'll only see your video throughout the session. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, I did that. Okay, so another question, sir. Um, so after you split the chlorine molecule, you have two products of chlorine, right? I can go to one of the farms along with H from the methane. So you have H there, but what about the other radical? Isn't that going to form a bond with the um, radical of methane? And sorry, just to just start over again, please. So after what happens? So I don't, I'm not getting your step to where you have a next molecule of chlorine. Yeah. Wouldn't the radical of chlorine that would attach to the methyl radical? So remember here, remember in the, in the reaction container, you have to visualize it. You have a lot of alkane molecules. You have, you have a lot of everything. So, this uh, radical, so you are correct. A uh, radical, a radical, so a next chlorine radical can combine with this radical as well. But that's for our next step for termination. All right. So the two radicals can combine. That's where the reaction would terminate. But for the propagation step, we are looking at the radical reacting with the next molecule of chlorine because in the reaction container you will have a lot of chlorine molecule chlorine radical methyl radical as well as the methane molecule um sorry you said you'd have the um the two methyl radicals combining that is possible any two radicals oh, can combine oh. That one though, but okay, so I was talking about that one, but okay. I was saying also the chlorine radical can combine with it, but that is not for the propagation stage. That is when we were when we will look at termination. Okay, sir. Yes. So for the propagation stage, we are looking at the methyl radical wrapped in a chlorine molecule. So in propagation, the first step your chlorine radical is going to attack the methane molecule. And so we generate the methyl radical and we get the HCl. In step two, it's the reverse now. The methyl, the methyl radical is going to attack a chlorine molecule. And so we're going to get chloro, methane, the chlorine radical. All right, that is step two. And typically, someone make his hand just near the mic.
Assim eu acredito. Ah, uh, one second, sir. Yeah. Sir, um, I have a suggestion, sir. If you, if you could meet me a co-host, I actually could like mute anybody's mic that goes off, so you wouldn't have to like stop in the middle, so you can discuss. All right. Oh, um, man, come in there. Um, oh, I'm being so scared. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Host, and then, sir, as soon as somebody. Oh, so that option to make your oh make host. Yeah, me see. No, not host, sir. Co-host. You oh, co -host? host. Yes, sir. Um, how me undo that? Um, sir? Yes? Maybe maybe in the future you can go in the Zoom settings on the web and um click the settings to mute the participants upon entry. So you don't have to deal with persons might be open as soon as they join. Something they make him the person and we can't undo it. Or we undo it. He Hold has on. to yeah, I just undid it. I undid it, sir. I mean, I have one shot. Yeah. Just make me call who sir. I'll just sign it. I just see make make host. I'm not seeing co-host. All right, so I guess we'll just have to work with it there. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to post it on YouTube as well. All right, so typically, if you are just doing a single substitution, it's just two steps. Chlorine removes the hydrogen, you get a methyl radical. And in step two, the chlorine molecule breaks, one of the chlorine atom bonds with carbon, and that's it. Good? Two steps. If you want a next chlorine on it, the process starts over again. The same two steps are going to be repeated. So step three is basically going to be like step one. Remember now, at the end of step two, we have chloromethane. So when we're starting step three, we should start with chloromethane. Remember, everything is repeating itself. Nothing new is happening. Instead of methane, we have chloromethane. Everything stays the same, except the product here, instead of a methyl radical, it would be the chloro, the acyl group on it. Here, if you notice, I am not troubling any of the curved arrows for the, any of the fish hooks. All I am doing is putting a chlorine on it, nothing else. And this would, step two would be step four. I did not touch any of the fish hooks. That means the mechanism, it stays the same. The only difference where I have methane, it's chloromethane. That is it. Everybody is still up? Yes, sir. So now we have dichloromethane. What if we wanted trichloromethane? What would happen? So I repeat the step using dichloromethane. Exactly. Repeat the steps using dichloromethane. That is it. So you just keep on repeating it each time. All right. So that's what happens in propagation. So just be careful if you are getting free radical substitution, just look if they want you to do one substitution, two or three. 
All right, so for each substitution, it's two steps. So if you are doing two substitution, it would be four steps. All right, so each time you have to replace a hydrogen with a chlorine, it requires two steps. All right, now after propagation takes place, so in this reaction, as long as a radical is present, the reaction can keep on going. So to stop the reaction, we need to use up our free radicals. And that is what is going to terminate the reaction. So in the third stage of the reaction, it's going to be termination. So in termination, all you would do, look at any free radicals that were generated through the process. So at the start of the reaction, we have two chlorine radicals, right? So those could have combined to form back the molecule of chlorine. Give me two other radicals that could have combined. Two methyl radicals. That is correct. And that would have given us ethane. Also, the methyl radical and the chlorine radical could combine. We have chloro methane. So in termination, three radicals are combining. So you pick any two combination of three radicals and combine them. Mm -hmm. So that's the mechanism for free radical substitution. So after this halo alkane. Halo alkanes are fall into two types of reaction mechanism based on their structure. So we can have so we can have primary, secondary, and tertiary halo alkane. So let us go straight to halo alkanes. Remember, we are doing the reaction mechanisms for alkanes, halo alkanes, and alkenes. So if you want to know, what about CCL4? If you wanted CCL4, you would do an extra two steps to replace the final hydrogen. And so you would end up with CCL4. All right, so for Hela alkane, you can have primary, secondary and tertiary. Excuse me, sir. Go ahead. This you're under you're under the topic functional group analysis. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay. But they just put alkenes and alkenes, but halo alkene is close enough so they may send it. So I'm just making sure if it comes, we are prepared. So when you want to know if you have a primary, secondary, or tertiary halo alkane, you are going to highlight the carbon to halogen bond. So just make a note of your carbon halogen bond. So the carbon that is attached to your halogen, if three other carbons are attached to it, it is tertiary in the alkene. All
Again, let us highlight the carbon to halogen bond. If two carbons are attached to it, it's a secondary halo halogen. And if only one carbon is attached, so there's one carbon atom, then it is primary halo alkene. So that is the first thing you must be able to do. De determine if you have a primary, secondary, or tertiary halo alkene, because that will determine the type of mechanism that will take place. All right, so that is already it. Is anybody writing this? If not, I'm going to move on. I'm writing. All right. I'm writing, sir. Just let me know when you're finished. I'm finished, sir. Right. Anybody else? All right, go for this. All right. So, if you want to know the category of halo alkane that you have, you are going to highlight the carbon that is bonded to your halogen. The carbon attached to your halogen, you are going to look at how many carbon atoms are attached to it. So if you look at this carbon atom, you have one carbon atom here that is directly attached to it. There's a next one here that is also directly attached to it. And there is one more here. So if three carbon atoms are directly attached to the carbon with the halogen, it's a tertiary halo alkene. If you look at this one, right, this carbon bonded to the halogen, only one carbon atom is attached to it. And so we say it is primary. And if you look at this one, even though you have two carbon atoms here, only this carbon atom is attached to it and this one here. So two carbon atoms are attached to the carbon bonded with the halogen. So when it's two carbon atoms, it's secondary. Only one carbon atom, primary, and three carbon atoms, tertiary. Mm -hmm. So onto the mechanism now. There are two types of mechanism, SN1 and SN2. We're going to do SN2 first. And for SN2, only primary halo alkanes undergo SN2 mechanism. And in this mechanism, so with this mechanism, the Halo alkanes, they undergo nucleophilic substitution. And the typical are the, the nucleophile that is used for K is sodium hydroxide. Mm. 
So this is nucleophilic substitution, right? Let us look at the mechanism of our SNG. I'm going to use chloromethane. If you react chloromethane with sodium hydroxide, you are going to get an alcohol. So you can you can get an alcohol from a halo alkane if you react it with sodium hydroxide. In the mechanism, however. We are not going to be using sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a positive ion, so it's not a nucleophile. When you have a solution of sodium hydroxide, you have sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So the hydroxide ion is your nucleophile. Okay? So it's not the entire sodium hydroxide component. It's just the hydroxide ion that is going to be your nucleophile. This reaction, it occurs in a single step. The nucleophile And by the way, you now the only time, the only mechanism that we use a fish hook is free radical substitution. Anything other than free radical substitution, we are going to be using a curved arrow. Here, the nucleophile is going to use a pair of electrons to attack the carbon atom bonded to the halogen. And so, remember, a curved arrow is used when you are transferring a pair of electrons. So we're going to transfer a pair of electrons from the nucleophile to the carbon atom. When that happens, so we have a nucleophilic attack on the carbon atom. Also, this carbon atom here, right? It is bonded to a halogen, which is an electronegative atom. So this carbon atom, it will carry a slightly positive charge. And the halogen will carry a slightly negative charge. So the nucleophile affects the carbon atom. And the bond between the carbon and the halogen is going to break heterolytically. All right. Now, this reaction, it goes through what is called a transition state. And in the transition state, it shows the bond between the carbon and the halogen partially broken, and the bond between the nucleophile and the carbon partially being, being formed. And to do that, we're going to use broken lines. So this means that the bond between the carbon and the chlorine is partially broken. And the bond between the carbon and the nucleophile is partially, partially formed. And you put back the hydrogens on it. All right, and this is their transition state. After your transition state, you will show the bond between the carbon and the halogen completely broken, and the bond between the carbon and the nucleophile completely, completely formed. So I'm going to, to put that one up here. All 
All right, so it's one step. So nuclear pile attacks the carbon atom, the bond between the carbon and the chlorine breaks, et cetera, basically you have your transition state, and then you have your final product where the bond between the nucleophile and the carbon completely formed, and the bond between the carbon and the chlorine is completely broken. And so you'll get your alcohol and your chloride ion. And that is SN2, just one step. Attack, transition state, final product. Sir. Yes. So the, the chlor the chlorine ion goes with the two electrons, sir. That is correct. So when the bond breaks ethereal that atom gets the two elections and remember we said that a curved arrow is used to show the transfer of two two elections so the chlorine the chlorine atom got the two elections to become the chloride ion You can go ahead and see someone bring their hands. Ellington, if you have a question, you can answer. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, my question is, sir, if since the OH has a negative charge, in, sir, is it safe to say that it's an um nucleophilic substitution? Yes, that is the direction of L alkanes. Okay. So one nucleophile is substituted in the next one. But you would have to specify that it is SN2. Mm -hmm. So they can have SN1 as well. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Also, I needed to clarify something as well. Yeah. The reactions with bromine, they are electrophilic, right, sir? But well, the thing that. Wait, you mean with bromine and alkene? Yes. Yes. I'm going to My show quest... you. Yeah, go on. My question is that I always mix them up because um, I'm thinking bromine has a negative charge as well. That is, I'm so. going to show you. I'm going to when we, when we get to alkene, I'm going to show you why it's actually electro. All right. Okay. Yeah, man. So you you will see. All right, sir. Yeah, man. All right. So let us do SN2, not SN2, SN1. And by the way. What is the name of this compound? Methanol. Methanol. Yes, that is correct. And what would be a reaction of this compound? Any reaction? Give me one, one reaction of that compound. Combustion. Combustion is correct. Any other one? Dehydration. Dehydration is correct. And of course, oxidation with dichromate or per manganate. All right, for SN1, the secondary and tertiary alkyl alkanes will undergo SN1. Primary. You see the primary alo alkanes, they cannot form a stable carbocation. But the secondary and tertiary alo alkane, they can form a stable carbocation. So when we're doing SN, SN1, it actually occurs in two steps. And the first step is the formation of our carbocation. So these two types of alo alkanes, they can form a stable. Carbocation. All right. And the Excuse example, me, sir. Yes. What does the essence stand for? Nucleophilic substitution. 
but then just put it as SN. Okay. Because remember, Taylor alkanes undergo nucleophilic substitution. Okay. So I'm going to use a tertiary Taylor alkane. So step one, it will be to it will be to form our carbocation. What is a carbocation? Carbon the positive charge. Is this compound a tertiary halo alkene? Secondary. Yes, sir. Are you sure? Secondary. It's a secondary. Secondary. That's a two other. Right. You see this hydrogen? Remember, the carbon attached to your halogen, it must have three carbons attached to it for it to be tertiary. But in this case, a hydrogen is attached to it. So can you repeat the meaning, the meaning for a carbocation? It's simply a carbon with a positive charge. So remember cations are positive ions, right? So carbo is short for carbon. So it's basically a carbon cation. And so a positively charged carbon. Now, in step one, to form the carbocation. So remember, this bond, your carbon to halogen bond, it is polar. So carbon with any element from group five to seven, it's polar. And if it's polar, it means that your electronegative atom is going to have a slightly negative charge and the carbon atom is going to have a slightly positive charge. That is what it means to be polar. One atom in the one atom in the bond, it has a slightly positive charge, and the next atom has a slightly negative charge. So if you have a polar bond and it is going to break, it is going to break heterolytically, and so we use a term arrow. When a bond breaks heterolytically, which two species are produced? The nucleophile yeah. and electrophile, that is correct. So we are going to get our carbocation, which is the electrophile. And the chloride ion, which is our nucleophile. So we have just formed our cargo cation. In step two, we're going to have nucleophilic attack. On the cargo cation. Sorry, not the chloride ion, the hydroxide ion. So remember the hydroxide ion is our nucleophile. So the product of our nucleophilic substitution is always an alcohol because we are using the hydroxide ion as the nucleophile. And so that is the two mechanisms for 
alo alkenes. In SN2, it's a single reaction. I mean, I mean a single step. But in SN1, it's two steps because the carbocation produced is stable. Primary alo alkenes do not form stable carbocations. Excuse me, sir. Yes. So is it um only number two and three will form carbocatenation? The carbocation, the secondary and tertiary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so after this mechanism, we have three more mechanisms to look at, and those three are for other keys. Is anybody ready at this point? Sorry. And the mechanism for alkenes is electrophilic addition. And the first one we're going to do is the addition of HBr. So if you wrap the alkene with HBr, what will be produced? Okay. You will get an halo alkene. Remember, remember, Mark Kovnikov rule. When you are adding a hydrogen ala to an alkene, let me just put on the hydrogen here. The atom goes to the carbon with the least hydrogen. That is correct. So in adding HBr, the bromine atom is going to go to the carbon atom of the double bond with the lesser amount of hydrogen. So bromine will go to this carbon atom and the hydrogen to that one. All right. And so we would get our halo alkene. Now let's look at the mechanism. Sir? Yes? Why is it an electrophilic addition again? Please repeat. All right, yes, I'm sir. Going to show you now. I'm going to show you now. All right. So let us draw the alkene. And let us draw HBr. This one here, so remember, it's about the, it has to deal with the electrical negativity of the atoms. Bromine is in group seven, which means it is an electro negative atom. Hydrogen is not an electro negative atom. So when the two of them form a covalent bond and the electrons are being shared, they are going to be shared unevenly or unequally. All right? So, the electrons are going to be pulled closer to bromine. And so the, the electron density around bromine is going to be high. And so it develops a slightly negative charge. 
whereas the hydrogen it, de it develops a slightly positive charge because the even though they are sharing electrons, the electrons are pulled down towards the bromine atom. And so the bromine atoms develop a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen atom develops a slightly positive charge. So if this hydrogen atom has a slightly positive charge, that makes it an electrophile. And we're adding the hydrogen to the alkene. So we're first adding an electro, electrophile, and so it is electrophilic addition. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, could you go again one more time, please? So hydrogen is not an electronegative atom. Bromine is an electronegative atom. An electronegative atom or electronegativity is the ability of an atom to pull electrons towards itself. So if bromine is an electronegative atom, then it is going to pull the electrons that are being shared in the bond closer towards itself. Let us say the bond, the, the electrons are supposed to be in the middle, since it is being shared. Bromine being electronegative, pull them closer to itself. So even though they are being shared, it basically is attached to bromine. So the electron density around bromine increases. And so it develops a slightly negative charge because it is electronegative. And the hydrogen as a result of not having the electron close enough, it develops a slightly positive charge. All right. And this one here is polar. When we say something is polar, one end is slightly positive and the next end is slightly negative. All right. So the HBr molecule, it is polar. Now the alkene is actually a nucleophile. Does anyone know why the alkene is a nucleophile? Sir, because of the pi. Right, because of the, the pi bond. Yeah. So remember, a double bond is made up of a sigma bond and a pi bond. The sigma bond is their single bond, all right? That is used to join the two carbon atoms together. Your second bond is a pi bond. I'm going to join it in blue. The pi bond has in two electrons, but that, those two electrons are thus there. They are not used in bonding. So if you have a pair of electrons not doing anything, then once an electrophile comes close to it, it is going to attack it. And that is why alkenes undergo addition reactions. The pi electrons of the double bond, they are your nucleophile, essentially. And they will attack any electrophile. So here, it is the, when we say the double bond is attacking the H here, it is actually the pi, the pi electrons that are doing the attacking. And also, when we use the word attack, it just means that we are forming a dative covalent bond. Remember, in a, in a dative covalent bond, one atom donates both electrons to the next atom. So this nucleophilic attack is basically a dative covalent bond being, being formed between the carbon atom and the hydrogen. So all we will do is draw a curved arrow from the double bond to the hydrogen. Now, 
when this happens, right, these two electrons are being used to form a bond with hydrogen. So hydrogen is coming out. So that means this bromine atom is going to get the next two electrons. Right? And that is what happens. The double bond it attacks the hydrogen of the HBr molecule, and the bond between the HBr it breaks hetero mythically with the halogen within both of the electrons. Sir, can you repeat? So the double bond. It attacks the hydrogen of the HBr. That means you are supposed to draw a curved arrow starting from the double bond and pointing towards the hydrogen. That is showing the attack. When the hydrogen gets attacked, the bond between the hydrogen and the bromine it is going to be broken heterolytically. And to show that, you have to draw a curved arrow from the bond to the bromine atom. So nucleophilic attack on the HBr molecule, the bond between hydrogen and bromine, it breaks heterolytically. So what we will end up with, one, two, three. Remember the hydrogen comes out first, and it must go to the carbon of the double bond with the more hydrogen. So it will come here. If you notice this carbon, it will only have three bonds. A carbon atom forming three bonds, that is a carbon cation. So in this step, we will form a carbon cation. Always put on your hydrogens. Do not do this on the exam. Do not do this. Put on your hydrogen. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, step one we have produced our carbon cation. Let me just make a little note of what happened. Excuse me, sir. Yes. This is not related to this question is not related to this. But is isomerism coming on the exam? Isomerism, isomerism comes under structure and formulae. Okay. So yes, yes. So Thank it can come. It doesn't have to come, but it comes under structure and formulae. <clears throat> So it is a nucleophilic attack on the HBr molecule by the pi electrons of the carbon to carbon double bond, resulting in the formation of our carbocation.
if you have the, so just reply to someone, if you have the time, study it as well. Can I raise the board now? Is any moderating? Sorry. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, as in I can erase? As in I'm still writing. Okay. You may. So this mechanism it consists of two steps. So in step two, we will have a nuclear pellet attack. on the carbon cation. And so that is the mechanism for the addition of an hydrogen halide to alkenes. Two steps. First step, you form your carbocation. The second step, your bromide ion is going to attack the carbocation. What is the name of this compound over here? Bromopropane. Two bromopropane. Right. Two bromo. Propane. What kind of halo? What kind of halo alkane is it? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Secondary, sir. Secondary. Secondary, sir. What is Sir, I'm going to ask you a possible question. I'm, I'm going to the all the mechanisms first. If I have okay. the time, I'll go through it. But there are already videos on the channel with past paper. Just go to the just go to the unit two playlist and look at the headings. There are already past papers and reactions of alkenes and other stuff. Right, but if I have the time, I will do a first paper. All right, All right thank you, sir. Sorry, I did uncertainty yesterday. No, tomorrow. We didn't get to do the uncertainty. Just <laughs> we did government and titration. Sir, we're having a <laughs> we're, Yes, we're having class tomorrow again. What are we going to do tomorrow, sir? Uncertainty and hopefully some maduchi. I don't like maduchi. That's just reading, but I will say. Okay, thank you, sir. But the what is happening in this squad? Additional bromine iron. Please repeat. I'm saying what they said that means this step the addition of the bromine iron is to the carbon cation. But if you are, it's a new term where we are adding the bromide iron to it. But don't, if you are going to write a statement, don't write addition of bromide ion, write nuclear attack. 
So it's supposed to be nuclear to the attack. So sorry, this is the reaction. Okay, so. So this is the reaction between hydrogen bromide or any hydrogen alide and an alkene. So this is the mechanism for the addition of hydrogen alide to an alkene. Right, so I can, here is the board now. Go ahead, Natena, with your question. Plates. All right, so the next re reaction is going to be the addition of halogens to the alkenes, so halogenation of alkenes. And we're going to be using bromine. However, there must be a distinction. Bromine can be in the form, so it can be liquid or it can be dissolved in water. So it can be bromine water or aqueous bromine. These two, the mechanism will start with the same, but it will end differently. It will end differently if it's aqueous versus liquid. So we are going to do the liquid part, then the aqueous one. So we're going to start off with the addition of liquid bromine. All right, so here we have bromine, here we have our alkene. Remember, we have the pi electrons of the alkene. When the bromine molecule approaches the double bond of the alkene, the pi electrons are going to repel electrons in the bromine molecule. What is going to happen is that the electrons are going to push further down in the molecule. They are going to be closer to this one. So this bromine molecule, sorry, this bromine atom, the electron density is going to increase. So it gives a slightly negative charge. This bromine atom, the electron density around it decreases. So it develops a slightly positive charge. In other words, your double bond induces a dipole in the bromine molecule. That is why we have the positive charge here and the negative charge. So this is where the, this is how the bromine atom becomes an electrophile because the double bond induces a dipole. So this atom, it becomes positive. This one becomes negative. Now, after it induces the dipole, this being a neutrophile and this being an electrophile, then it is going to attack this bromine atom here. And when it attacks this one, then the bond between the two bromine atoms 
are going to be is going to be. All right. So two things, two things happen here. Double bond, the pi electrons of the double bond induces a dipole in the Br molecule, and then the nucleophilic attack takes place. All right, and that happens. So the bond between the two bromine atoms breaks. So you should also get the bromide ion being produced. So let me just add to note. Sir, yes, yes. so the first BR, as in the BR, um, the positive charge, the electrophile, sir, it would bond with the carbon with the less, the least number of hydrogen bonds because it wants to form the more stable carbocation, which would be the secondary. Yes, what is over here? Um, okay, so what No, sir, that's not what I was saying, sir. Hmm? Sir, as in you were right with what you had. I'm just saying that the way you, we added the BR, you chose to add it to the middle carbon. So that means that you added it there because you wanted to form the more stable carbocation. No, if I, if I put it here, this is forming the more stable carbon then this one no if it was here if this is here and the positive charge is here this is a primary carbocation the more stable carbocation is when it is in the middle this is the secondary carbocation okay which is the more stable one yes Okay, sir. Yeah. So with Mark Kovnikov's rule, when he said that the hydrogen goes to the carbon, with the that already has more hydrogen. So let me just keep up and show you. So when we're when we were adding HBr to the alkene, remember it was the hydrogen that was added first, and it will come here, and the positive charge from here. And next we have seen it is that the reaction, it proceeds through the pathway that forms, that forms the more stable carbon cation. So the more stable carbon cation is the secondary one and not the primary one. So Mark chemical rule is of, although he said that the hydrogen comes to the one with the more hydrogen that because the reaction is proceeding through the pathway 
that is forming the more stable carbocation. Just the under. All right, so in this first step here, dipole is induced when we have the nucleophilic attack resulting in the formation of the carbocation. And then in the second step, this bromide ion is going to attack the carbocation. Is anybody writing at this point? No, sir. Um, could you repeat the um, reaction, reaction mechanism, please? You said it was electrophilic addition? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, before, before this attacks the carbocation, we're going to have been, been formed what is called a bromonium ion. So this is step one. In step two, I'm going to draw about this here. And this bromine atom is actually going to form a bond with the carbocation. Okay. And so what you will have is a little triangle complex that we call the bromonium ion. So the bromine atom is bonded to both of the carbon atoms. And it will develop a slightly positive charge. All right. So in this step, it is the formation of a bromonium Right. So in this step, we are forming our bromonium ion. So this bromide, this bromine atom here, it attacks this carbon atom, the, the carbon ion actually. And so we end up with this structure, which we call a bromonium ion. Sir, um, what if we forgot this step? Would we get marked down for it? No, yes, because it's it is a part of the step. So yes. Sir. Yes. So is it because the BR when attached to the carbon um the carbon atom will have a slightly negative charge? Because it's more electronegative, that's why it's able to bond with the carbocation to form the bromonium ion. Yeah, I don't know why this bromine atom is able to bond with this. Sorry. Lone pairs. It still has lone pair of okay. electron. Are you hearing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm hearing you. Yes, sir, I don't get what's going on. No, so this bromine atom, all right, so remember, you know, in our study chemistry, right? Like when you say we write OH minus <laughs> the oxygen atom, it has lone pairs of electrons on it, but we are not going to put it on. But you have to remember that lone pairs are there. Because you remember oxygen as what? Six valence electrons. Atomic number eight is yes. six valence electrons. If it's forming up with this, it's not using up all of them. So you have to remember it has lone pairs. The same thing with bromine atoms. Even though you don't still put on the lone pairs, you have to remember that they are there. 
So at this point, what we are using is one of those lone pairs to attack the carbon next to it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So just remember here, we don't put lone pairs on it unless we are going to use them. So even H2O, the oxygen atom in H2O, it also has lone pairs, but we are not going to put it on unless we are going to use it. All right, so just bear that in mind. So after you form your carbocation, the bromine atom already attached to the carbon is going to attack the carbocation. And that is how we get the bromonium ion. Remember also, every nucleophilic attack, we are forming a native covalent bond. So if this attacks this carbon, it must form a bond. So when we say nucleophilic attack, a bond is being, a bond is being formed. Hence, two bonds are now being formed by this bromine atom. All right. No, benzene should not fall on the but honestly, I just, you know, KB is, um, if you have the time, I look at it. it. No, as in benzene is aromatic chemistry. This is aliphatic chemistry. So benzene should be nowhere near these. All right, so step one, step two, we have a final step, which involves the bromide ion from step one. So step three, it is nucleophilic atom. on the bromonium ion. So let us draw on our bromonium ion. So your bromide ion is going to attack this carbon. And so the bromine atom here, it is going to take both electrons from the carbon to bromine bond here. And so you will end up with this structure. So the general name for this chapter is a dialyte. So when you when you react when you react liquid bromine with alkenes, the general term for the compound produced is a dialyte because you have two halogens attached to it. And so the addition of liquid bromine is three steps. Form the carbocation, then you form the bromonium ion, and then the final product is the dialyte. 
So that is when I'm using liquid, there will be So I said the bromine attached to the first car, but we will move to the one in the middle. This one, yeah. Because remember, it has two bonds now. So it's literally, it has formed two bonds with the carbon atoms. So when this one attacks this one, it takes the, the electrons from this carbon. So the, the bond between it and this carbon is broken. Okay. Yeah, because this one is attacking this one, meaning is forming a bond with it. So this one now removes the electron from it. And remember, put on your hydrogens. Is anybody writing at this point? All right. Notice I changed the state, the state symbol from liquid to aqueous. When it's aqueous, water is also going to act as the nucleophile. So for the mechanism, step one and step two will stay the, will stay the same. So you will get the carbocation, then you will get the ammonium ion. But at step three, we have nucleophilic attack on the bromonium and the bromonium ion by the bromide ion. This is where the mechanism changes. Sir, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, so like I think the without the bromonium ion. So like how do we know if we're supposed to draw like the full reaction with the bromonium ion step or to just like draw the simplified version where it's like they don't include that step. I think that's what I saw in the textbook. So like how do you know which one to draw on the and exam? They, they skip the bromonium ion in this study guide. Um uh, or in your, I in think, your textbook. I well, think so. I don't think my teacher, well, I don't know. But I don't I saw it somewhere, but like sometimes I don't I don't know. Sorry, wait, did they put it in the study guide? No, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't skip it. Okay, so include it yes. like every time. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, man. Oh, and when you have it, put a slightly positive charge on it. All right. Don't leave it off. All right. So, whether it's liquid or aqueous bromine, which is bromine water, step one and step two is the same. However, in step three, the bromide ion is not going to do the nucleophilic attack. It's going to be a molecule of H2O. And as you see here, I don't put any down here of it of electron on, on the water here, but in the mechanism, remember, we are transferring a pair of electrons. So it is at this point, I put on the, on the lone pair. So water is acting as our nucleophile. And so this is what you will get in step three. The water does a nucleophilic attack on this. 
And so water is attached to the carbon atom that is step three. So instead of the bromide ion, you have H2O. No, this is not the final step. So when water acts as the nucleophile, you have one additional step, step four. So here we have the water molecule attached to the carbon atom. And we're going to use the next molecule of water to remove our hydrogen. So let us drop up here. So we have our water molecule attached. And then the next molecule of water Going to remove a hydrogen, right? So it's a nuclear click attack, removing this hydrogen. And so, if you are removing this hydrogen, the electrons from this bond will go back to oxygen. And so, you will end up with Br and OH. Plus H zero plus. So if it's a chaos bromine, this is how the mechanism ends. You see, I'm on a you too. I'm doing as well now. Sir, can you go over that again, please? Sure. All right, so in step three, the water molecule, the water molecule is attached to this carbon atom here. In step four, we are using a next molecule of water to remove one of the hydrogen atoms here, so this is the molecule of water that is attached to the structure. We are using a new molecule of water to remove one of the hydrogens here. And so if you are removing this hydrogen, something must happen to the electrons in, in the bond here, and they are going back to oxygen. So if you remove a hydrogen, that means you are left with OH. And if this hydrogen is attached to H2O, then you will end up with the hydroxonium ion. So if it's aqueous bromine, the mechanism is four steps. 
in the first two steps, the bromine reacts with the alkene. And in the third and fourth step, two molecules of water take part in the reaction. So those are the mechanisms that you must know for alkene, sorry, for alkene. So we looked at the mechanism for alkane, alkene, and halo alkenes. I'm going to look at, I'm going to go back through the calculation for combustion analysis. All right, I have a little fusion in Mako. So let me go by it. Um, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, do we need to know um, the reaction with the cold and the hot came enough for? Yeah, man. You need to know all of those right. reactions. I, I was just looking at the mechanisms. But yeah, those it don't require a mechanism. All right, sir. Yeah. So I was looking at the mechanism first. Go ahead. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Do we have to know primary and secondary alcohols? I would, I'm going to look at it. I don't. All right, so if you hydrate an alkene, you can get an alcohol. So if you, when you get the alcohol, even though alcohol is not under the broad topics, if you hydrate the alkene and get the alcohol, then they might ask you something about the alcohol. Understand? Yes, so sir. Alcohol, yeah, so look at it as well. So even though it's not there, they can try to link it and then ask you something about alcohol, even though it's not listed. It may not happen, but to be on this safe side, yeah, alkene, alkene, alcohol. We can stop there. There's no link between like aldehydes and ketones or carboxylic acid to the alkene, but they can try to link the alcohol with the alkene through hydration or the oxidation. Uh, sir, are we supposed to know the uh, reaction mechanism for sulfuric acid? No, no, no. Just the three, just the three I did here. HBr, aqueous bromine, and liquid. Me. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to go through a calculation for empirical and molecular formula quickly. The other bromine ion, it's just there. It just We are looking at the reactions of alkenes, but no one going to work a question on calculating empirical and molecular formula.
This is a transcript of Christian. What year, sir? Not sure, but it's before 2010. E, EF is empirical formula and MF is molecular formula. All right, everybody has the question now? Oh, yes, sir. All right. So I was still writing. And uh, and just where were you? Tell me what else. At CO two and zero point nine. Zero point nine three grams of water. And they gave the relative molecular mass of the compound, which is fifty. All right, that was it. And so we are going to use the, the information given to, to find the empirical and molecular formula. Now, this question, depending on the data that is provided, the calculation can vary. So when they give you the mass of CO2 and water, this is the type of calculation we are going to perform. To calculate the empirical formula, we need the mass of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, but they gave us the mass of CO2 and water. Now, a simple way to get the mass of carbon is just to dip so to get the mass of carbon. Just divide the 
relative atomic mass of carbon over that of CO2 times whatever mass of CO2 was given in the question. So in the question, it was 2.3 grams of CO2. So if you want the mass of carbon, simply divide the relative atomic mass of carbon, which is 12, over the molar mass for CO2, which is 44, times the actual mass of CO2 that is given in the question. And if you want to get the mass of hydrogen, you are going to put, so in hydrogen, so in water, you have two hydrogens. So that would be two divided by 18 times the mass of water, which is 0 0.93. All right, so Sir. The mass, yes. Sir, after the 0 0.93 gram, what did you say was missing? They gave us the molecular formula of the, sorry, the relative molecular mass of the compound, which is 58. That's of CO, that's of which compound? Of the compound? Compound A and B. Which is? We don't know, that is what we would figure out. So the RRM is? The molecular mass for compound A and B, but we don't know what compound A and B is. We are calculating the empirical and molecular formula for it, and then we would figure out what it actually is. So they just told us that mm -hmm. the relative molecular mass of it is 58. All right, with 0 0.627, that's the mass of carbon. Um, excuse me, sir. Yeah. So remind me how we got the 44 as the denominator. Just a second. All right, sir. Yeah. All right, so you have CO2, right? And what they are trying to figure out, so they gave you a mass for CO2. I want to know what mass of that CO2 is actually carbon. So if the molar mass for carbon is 44, and out of the 44, carbon is 12. So 12 over 44 actually give you the percentage of carbon in CO2, which is basically 20, 27%. So any mass of CO2 you get, 27% of it is carbon. So that is why I did 12 over 44. Understand? Yes, sir. Yeah, man. And the same thing now for hydrogen. In, the, in water, you have two hydrogen, which is a mass of two. So it's two over 18 times whatever mass of water you get. So the mass of carbon comes from CO2. The mass of hydrogen comes from water. The mass of oxygen, however. So they don't give periodic table, right? All right. No, you never get periodic table. No, just data booklet, but not periodic table. Okay, now for the mass of oxygen, it will be the mass of this sample minus the mass of carbon and hydrogen. So let's add up the mass of carbon and hydrogen. So 0 0.627 plus 0 0.103, you get 0 0.73. So the mass of this sample, it was one gram. We add the carbon and hydrogen and we get 0 0.73. So the mass of oxygen would be 0 0.27. Let me see if I
Yes, mm -hmm. sir, you're correct. All right, so we have the mass of carbon, mass of hydrogen, and the mass of oxygen. So now we can go ahead and start the actual calculation for the empirical formula. So we're going to have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And the first thing we're going to calculate is the moles. And we know that mole is mass divided by molar mass. Was anybody writing? I guess not. And so we're going to now divide by the smallest number of the three. So the, the empirical formula is equal to C3, H6, O. Sir. Yes. Yeah, there's something wrong, sir. Um, zero, eight, oh. No, it's right, sorry. All right. No, the answers for the molecular. Um, you have three carbons, so it couldn't be ethanol. Propanol. Propanol, sir. Um, sir, is it a ketone? Let us check. So we have three carbons. How many hydrogens do we have? Six, three, three and two, five. It couldn't be propanol, right? If it was propanol, it would have to have eight hydrogens. So that means it is an aldehyde or a ketone. That would be our ketone. And if it was an aldehyde, So it's either so they are it's either an aldehyde or a ketone. So don't erase, I'm going to write. The 0 0.0169 with it's the mass of it's the point two seven divided by sixteen. And once we get this answer. We, we compare the answer for the three of them. So this, this, and this. And whichever is the smallest, that is the one we divide all of them by. So because this is the smallest one, we divide all of them by it. So sir, all you know is that one, double pi. 
All right. So the compound has in oxygen, right? Aldehyde and ketones. So of all the functional groups that we look at, only aldehyde ketone are ever as in a single oxygen and alcohol as well. Clearly, this molecular formula does not fit the structure of an alcohol with three carbons. So the next structure in mind is the aldehyde or the ketone. So you just draw the structure for an aldehyde and a ketone with three carbons, and you see if it matches the molecular formula, and it does. So I put the double bond because that's the functional group for the ketone. Carbon to double bond oxygen with, an, with a carbon atom on either side. I'm probably starting at about four tomorrow. I will let you know. All right, so after this, it said we should calculate the molecular formula. So to calculate the molecular formula, we are going to find N, and N is simply the molar mass of the compound divided by the empirical formula mass. So we are going to calculate the mass of our empirical formula. So we have three atoms of carbon, so that's three times 12. We have six atoms of hydrogen, so that's six times one, and one atom of oxygen, that's one times 16. So 36 and six, that's 42, and 16, that would be 58 as well. So in our case, the molar mass of the compound was 58, and the empirical formula mass is also 58. So the answer for N is one. When you get the answer for N, you are going to multiply the molecular, sorry, you are going to multiply the empirical formula by whatever N is. So since N is one, you are going to multiply the empirical formula by one. Sir, can you go over that please? All right, so the question, it gave us the molar mass of the compound, which is 58. We are going to divide the molar mass of the compound by the empirical formula mass. The empirical formula is C3H6O. When we add up the mass of each atom, we also get back 58. So 58 divided by 58, we get one. So we're going to times our empirical formula by whatever we get here. And so because it's one, our empirical formula and molecular formula is the same, which is C3H6O. But for explanation purposes, right? Let us say the molar mass of the compound was 116. 116 divided by 58, we would get two. And so we would multiply the empirical formula by two. And so we would get, so two times three, that is C6, two times six, that is H12, and two times one, that is O2, right? N is one, and so our empirical formula is the same as our molecular formula. All right. If they want you to calculate, if they want you to calculate molecular formula they will give you the molar mass of the compound because you have to divide it by the empirical formula mass and the answer again, the times it by the empirical formula. Now there's a next type of question. So remember different data 
require different calculation. So I'm going to show you the next calculation, still empirical formula, but a different calculation. All right. Is anybody writing? This is our next first paper. I think it was 2011.
Is anybody still breaking? All right, so let me show you how to work it. So this question still dealing with this one, it will not ask for empirical formula. It will just ask for molecular formula. And it's a completely different way of working out from when they give you the mass of CO2 and water. In this one, you will get the volume of the hydrocarbon oxygen and the volume of CO2. In some questions, it will be clearer on how much CO2 you have, but some you have to figure it out. So let us read the question. So it says we have 10 CMQ of gaseous hydrocarbon. That is clear. But then we have 45 CMQ of oxygen. And it said it was exploded in a reaction chamber. That is just where the reaction is taking place. This is tip combustion. Hydrocarbon and oxygen combustion. Now, after cooling to room temperature, residual gases occupied 30 CMQ. The gases that would be present after the reaction is CO2 and Na on unreacted oxygen. So the residual gases would be the CO2 that is produced and any unreacted oxygen. By absorption with NaOH or KOH, whichever you see, the absorption, the gas being absorbed is CO2. So remember, after the, re after the reaction, you will have unreacted oxygen and the CO2 produced. The one that is being absorbed is the CO2. So by, by absorption with sodium hydroxide solution, a decrease in volume of 20 CMQ. So we add 30 CMQ at the end. When you add sodium hydroxide, it decreased by 20. So we add, so that means 20 CMQ of CO2 was produced. The, the remaining gas was shown to be oxygen. So of the 30, 20 is CO2. That means 10 is oxygen. So we started out with 45 oxygen. So at the start of the reaction, we had 45 CMQ of oxygen. But at the end of the reaction, we still have 10 oxygen remaining. That means a total of 35 CMQ of oxygen was used in the reaction. So you start out with 45. Yeah. When after the reaction is completed, you have 10 CMQ remaining. Therefore, 35 CMQ was used in the reaction. So to do this calculation, we are going to write an equation. So it's a hydrocarbon. We are going to write it in the form of CX HY reacting with O2 to produce carbon dioxide and water. Below each reactant and product, we are going to put the 10 CMQ right here. When it said by absorption with sodium hydroxide, a decrease in volume of 20 CMQ. At the end of the reaction, we have 30 CMQ of gases. 20 CMQ of the 30 was absorbed with NaOH. Once you see NaOH or KO, KOH, whichever reagent they use to absorb the gas, the gas being absorbed is CO2. So if 20 CMQ of the gas absorbed is CO2, then 20 from 30 leaves you with 10. That is where the 10 come from. And they said the, the remaining gas was shown to be 
oxygen. So at the start of the reaction, you use 45 cm cube of oxygen. And at the end of it, you have 10 cm cube of oxygen. And so we use up 35 oxygen. So for the reaction, we use 10 cm cube of our hydrocarbon, 35 oxygen, and we produce 20 CO2. What you are going to do is compare the three numbers and divide by the highest number possible. Now, based on this number, if you divide by 10, you are going to get a decimal. And if you get that decimal, you are going to put in a fraction. If you don't want to get a fraction, what is the highest number that can go in all of these? Five, sir. All right, so we're going to divide by five. So 10 divided by five is how much? Two, sir. And 35 divided by seven, five? Seven, seven, sir. And 24. All right. These are the moles that you are going to put in the balanced equation. So you have two moles of your hydrocarbon relative with seven moles of oxygen to produce four moles of CO2. Remember, the objective is to figure out the molecular formula of our hydrocarbon. The carbon dioxide produced is coming from the hydrocarbon. So if you have four moles of carbon dioxide, are four atoms of carbon here, how many atoms of carbon are present in the hydrocarbon? Bearing in mind, you have two moles of the hydrocarbon. Two, sir. Two. Because how we get four here, two times two, that is four. So we know that our hydrocarbon has in two carbons. Now, if you have seven moles of oxygen here, how many atoms of oxygen is present? 14. 14. 14. All right. So we have 14 oxygen atoms. How many oxygen do we have in CO2? Eight, sir. Eight. So if you have 14 oxygen on the reactant side, we must also have 14 on the product side. At the moment, we have eight. How much more do we need? Six, sir. And how many is present in water? One. one. So one time, so one time six is six. Right. So we would have six moles of water. So if you have six moles of water, how many hydrogen is present? Twelve. So if you have twelve hydrogen here, two moles of hydrocarbon. So how one is six, sir. Six. Right. And so the molecular formula of your hydrocarbon is C2H6. So when you get volume of the gases, this is how we break out the molecular formula. Let us just go over it again. So we from the question, we know we use 10 cm cube of the hydrocarbon, 35 cm cube of oxygen, and we produce 20 cm cube of CO2. Compare the three numbers and find the highest possible number that you can divide all three of them by without getting a decimal. In this case, it is five. The answer you get should go in the balanced equation. And so we get two moles of the hydrocarbon, seven moles of oxygen, four moles of carbon dioxide. Now, we are going to use the moles of carbon dioxide 
to get the moles of, sorry, to get the amount of carbon atoms in the hydrocarbon. So if you have four carbons here, and you have two moles of this, that means two carbon must be present because two times two will give you four. And then we look at how much oxygen atom you have. Seven twos, that's 14. So over here, we must have 14. In CO2, we have eight. Four twos, that gives you eight. That means we must have six in water to give us a total of 14. And once you balance water, that gives you the amount of hydrogen present in the hydrocarbon. So six two is 12, two six is 12. No. Sir. Yes? Sir, I don't understand how you get the oxygen to be 35 and the carbon dioxide to be 20. Were you present when we were going through the question? Yes, sir. I remember the question, it said at the end of the reaction, so we start out with 45 oxygen. That is what it said. We reacted 45 cm cube of oxygen with 10 cm cube of the hydrocarbon. At the end of the reaction, there are 30 cm cube of gases. And I said the two gases that are present would be oxygen and CO2. Unreacted oxygen and CO2. They told you that they use sodium hydroxide for absorption. And I specified that the, the gas being absorbed by NaOH is CO2. When they use the NaOH, the volume decrease not to 20, but it decreased by 20. It decreased by 20, means 20 cm came out. Oh, we could never live that way. Give me a second. Or oh, the social circle, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, so then, no, no. So that is how we get the 20 cm cube for CO2. And then they told you, so 30 minus 20, that is 10. So after you observe the 20, they said that the remaining gas, which is the 10 cm cube, was found to be oxygen. That means 10 cm cube of oxygen did not react. So you start out with 45 oxygen, but 10 of it did not react. That means only 35 out of the 45 actually reacted with the hydrocarbon. So that is how we got 35 and 20. Is it any clearer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. No, I'm going to work it with the fraction because you can get it as a fraction. Mm -hmm. So is anybody writing at this point? All right. So I'm not going to divide it by five. I am going to divide it by 10. So everything divided by 10. So I will get 1, 3.5, and 2. Three point five as a fraction is what? 
square and a half, right? So we don't use decimal in the equation, we use a fraction. Now, three and a half as an improper fraction, that is seven over two. So you can use three and a half, or you can write seven over two, whichever you prefer. One mole of the hydrogen, carbon, Ex HY. So based on this, we have one mole of the hydrocarbon. Let me put three and a half. So couldn't you just multiply the whole equation by two? That is what we did when we when we divided by five. But there's a scenario where it will be in the form of a fraction. If you when you finish, just check. I uploaded a 2016 paper with combustion analysis, and you have to do it like a fraction. So you can check it. So that is why I'm going to work it with this as a fraction. All right. So we have one mole of the hydrocarbon, three and a half moles of oxygen, and two moles of CO2. All right. So, so and the 26 yeah. pass paper is the improper fraction and we will stick, so not the mixed one. Yes, the, the y over two, I think it was what, y over two? Y over four. Oh, y over four, all right. So let's work with seven over two. Seven over two, I see. All right. So we have one mole of the hydrocarbon, seven over two moles of oxygen, and two moles of CO2. Let us proceed. Remember, the moles of carbon dioxide tells you how much, car how much carbon is present in the hydrocarbon. So you have two Cs here, that means how many carbon is in the hydrocarbon? Two, sir. Right. Let us add up the amount of oxygen that is present here. So seven, and a, seven over two, we know it's two and a half, right? So two and a half times two is how much? Seven, sir. Right. So we have seven atoms of oxygen. How many oxygen is present in CO2? Four, sir. Four. So if you have seven oxygen on the right hand side and four in CO2, how many must be present in water? Three, three. Three. So we have three moles of water. Now, how many moles of hydrogen is present here? Six. All right. So you still get six. All right. So I'm just showing you that whether you divide by the 10 going across or the highest number to give you a whole number. The hydrocarbon, the actual molecular formula, it will stay the same. All that would have changed when we use the five is the number of moles, but not the actual molecular formula. All right? So this is how you would do it. All right, let me see. I'm going to work one more quickly because I have to wrap. We're going to start at four tomorrow and we'll have some more past paper questions. Excuse me, sir. Can yes? we follow the same link? Please repeat. Can we use the same link tomorrow? Yes, it will be the same link. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put one question on the board and you'll try it. I'm going to work 2016 tomorrow. All right. But it's already on the channel if I want to see. But I'm going to work it tomorrow. So what's the name yeah. of the channel? Um, can someone just post it in the group for me? Thanks. In the chat. All right. So can I hear can I erase the board now? Yes, when you're going, there's a link just go in the cave. You need to play this, look for the 2016. Past paper. I did it. I worked a question for 2019. I don't remember. But tomorrow we are going to work just past papers. All right.
but I want you to try this one before we close. It's just like this one, but I want to see the okay. reason it out. Go ahead, build the question. Okay. So I want to give an ending card. Please repeat. What time do you, do you plan on ending oh. class? After we work. What time does class end? After we work this question, I'm going to close. And we are going to start at four or tomorrow. Probably to about eight as well. The person that was asking about titration, we need titration in this today's class. So you can just check the video that I posted. What year is this, sir? Sir? Yes. What year is this? This one, this is probably from about, I'm not seeing it, but based on the document I took it from, it's before 2010, probably about 2006 or so. Sir, yes. is that 15 or 10? Is that 10, sir? Yeah, it's 10. Excuse me, sir. Are the, is this a topic you've been working since five, or did you? Well, we did. We did the the reaction mechanisms for alkenes, in alkenes, and alkenes. Okay, thank you. Come on. Right, so I'm going to give you a chance to attempt it. And I'm not sure exactly which year it is, but it's, a, it's an old question from the early 2000s, right? Now, when you're interpreting the question, right, when you get to this point, just interpret it correctly. So it says the volume of the explosion was 100 cm cube, and this was reduced all right, it did not decrease by 60, it was reduced to 60. So just interpret it correctly. All right, so I will give you about four minutes to attempt it and then we work it out.
Sir? Yes? Are you supposed to tell the mole ratio or the equation itself? We are going to, we are going to do it just, just like we did a while ago. Yes, sir, but I'm asking for the answer. Are we supposed to tell you the, the, the equation? No, no man, just the formula for the hydrocarbon. I got C6H4. C6H4? Yes, sir. No, remember it's a hydrocarbon, so it must be an alkane or an alkene. Sir, is it C4H8? It, I think it is. Yes. I think it's C4H8. It's an alkene. Yeah. Remember, all right, the person that got that answered first, what did you use for the volume of CO2? Sir, I use 60. Thank you. No. Remember, that is why I highlighted this. You add 100 and it was reduced to 60. Okay. They're okay. supposed to say 100 minus 60. Yes, sir. So right. So is the 120 actually the value for the excess oxygen alone? Nothing is supposed to be added? No, all right. So when they said excess here, it means that we add enough oxygen to ensure that all of the hydrocarbon reacts. If you notice, so you have to look at what we start out with and what we end with. So 120 cm of oxygen was exploded. The volume after the explosion was 100 cm cube and it was reduced to 60. So from 100 to 60, it means 40 cm cube was removed. And it said what? Well, it was reduced to 60 on treatment with KOH. I remember I said KOH or NaOH is added to remove CO2. So if it decreased from 100 to 60, when you add KOH, so it was 100 and it decreased to 60, that means we remove 40 CMQ. So the 60 is oxygen. Because remember the two gases that are present after the reaction, it is CO2 and O2. So if of the 140 is CO2, that means 60 is oxygen. So you start off with 120 oxygen, but 60 did not react. So for oxygen, you start out with 120 and 60 remain. That means only 60 reacted. So in your equation, you should have 40 CO2, 60 oxygen, and 10 CM cube of your hydrocarbon. You understand? Yes, sir. So I could write the question now. Sure. Oh, sir. Sir. Oh, yes, somebody have a question? Yes, sir. I was wondering if you sent a document. You want the document with these questions? Yes, sir. All right, just you have my email address already? No, I do not, sir. First time. Thanks, sir. All right, so just send it to that and I will send it. All right, so it's a hydrocarbon, so CX, HY, so CX, HY plus O2 to give you carbon dioxide and water. So we have 10 hydrocarbon, 60 oxygen, and 40 CO2. We can divide by 10. And so we get one, six, 
and four. So we have one mole of hydrocarbon, six mole of oxygen, four mole of CO2. If we get four mole of CO2, how many carbons are present in the hydrocarbon? Four. Four, sir. That, that is correct. How many atoms of oxygen do we have? Twelve. Four. Twelve. And how many atoms of oxygen do we have in CO2? Eight. Eight. So how many do we need here? Four. Four. That is correct. And so if you have four moles of water, how many hydrogen is present? Eight. Eight. So how many should be here? Eight. That is Eight. correct. So our hydrocarbon is C4H8. All right, good job. Sir, I have a question. Sure. Um, so to find for the to find amount of carbon dioxide, the volume of carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. I just said that when it was reduced to 60 centimeters cube, I said that mm -hmm. that was the amount of oxygen that was there. And then I said 109 or 60. Is that carbon? Can I do it like that? Just uh, it decreased so from 100 to it decreased from 100 to 60. Mm -hmm. Continue. Yes, so I said that we read up to 60. I mm -hmm. used that 60 to say that was the oxygen. And then I said 100 minus the 60 to give me the 40 to deduce what was the volume for the carbon dioxide. Yeah, so sure. I'm saying that will, okay. Yeah, man, it works. Yeah, man. Right. Because the 60 is oxygen, right? So the subject and get it. All right. So this is where I'm going to close for tonight. Let me just end the recording.